All right, everyone. So what I'm going to be talking about here today is always fraught with a little bit of danger in terms of having conversations about gender roles in history. Uh, I'm going to be talking through this from a very historical context, and I'm going to be calling out uh, things that I think are done incorrectly when reporting on news on things that have to deal with gender roles today in our modern society. Um, and this is not intended to be any type of political discussion, and I would ask that comments refrain from being overly political or uh, sexist even, um, because that's not really the intent here. I want us to have an open discussion about how we view history and how we uncover history and archaeology. And I think that that gets undercut greatly if we, uh, if we treat this incorrectly. And um, that's really not my intent. So I want to talk about this because I think it's important. I think it's important to understand history and to do it in a way that's beneficial. And likely the end result of this is I'm going to make both sides of the issue actually really upset at me. Oh well, I, I like to kind of sit in the middle and actually talk about these things from a ver very, very realistic and straightforward perspective. Um, but we're going to be taking a look at some news stories here. Uh, so this is from the New York Post, that bastion of wonderful news article writing. Uh, I will make a general note here that I feel like that this is actually a fairly poorly written article because it kind of plays a telephone game with the information. Um, but the information that it's talking about is correct, and we'll get to that in a moment. But I, I kind of want to go through this flow of my thinking when I read articles like this. Uh, so this says, Viking skeletons DNA test prove historians wrong. The remains of a powerful Viking long thought to be a man was in fact a real-life Xena warrior princess, a study released Friday reveals. Uh, Xena was Greek? So we're talking about uh, Scandinavian here. By the way, I'm going to be really clear here. When we say Viking and we say Scandinavian, that's kind of two different things. And I think that's going to be important a little bit later in this discussion. The Lady War boss was buried in the mid-10th century along with deadly weapons and two horses, leading archaeologists and historians to assume she was a man, according to the findings published in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. Wrong. Um... Oh, such great journalistic things here. Wrong, not. Um, you can. I, I don't have a problem with the concept of there being a female warrior, but I think the way this tonally comes out is a little bit odd. It act. It, um, it's actually woman. This is in quotes. It's actually woman somewhere over the age of thirty and fairly tall too, measuring around five feet six inches tall. Archaeologist Charlotte. Haddon Sternia Johnson of Upala University, um, sorry, Uppsala University, uh, who conducted the study, told the local, the local being a news agency. And she was likely in charge. Aside from the complete warrior equipment buried along with her, a sword, an axe, a spear, armor-piercing arrows, a battle knife, shields, and two horses, she had a board game in her lap or more of a war planning game, used to try out battle tactics and strategies, which indicates she was a powerful military leader. Uh, Hedden Sterna Johnson, I'm probably butchering that name, I apologize, said, she most likely planned, led, and, ta and taken part in battles. I'm going to get back to this thing about the board game in a bit, because I think it actually underscores a thing that I really can't stand about the way we make supposition in archaeological discoveries. I'll get to that in a moment. The discovery marks the first gender, uh, sorry, genetic proof that women were Viking warriors, according to the scientific publication Fizz.org. The Viking grave was found first and exca excavated by Swedish archaeologist Hjalmir Stolp in the late 1800s. But a few years ago, osteologist Anna uh, Gjellström, probably how you say that, uh, of Stockholm University noticed its skeleton had fine cheekbones and feminine hip, hip, feminine hip bones, researchers said. They conducted DNA analysis and confirmed it was female. This image of the male warrior in a patriarchal society was reinforced by research traditions and contemporary preconceptions, hence the biological sex of the individual was taken for granted, Hedden Sternia Johnson and other researchers wrote in the report. The research was led by the Stockholm and Uppsala universities. So this is actually really cool and interesting from a revisiting um, practices, especially very early on in the archaeological life cycle. What I mean by that is archaeology in the late 1800s is actually, it was relatively new and there were certainly things that were done wrong. 
Um, and they have echoes today, and we'll talk about this in a bit, but that um, it was really common, especially in, in gravesite burials, not just in the quote-unquote Viking gravesite burials, but just really any gravesite burial, that, that they would look at the, the artifacts and say, well, that probably meant this was a man or a woman, which is not a good way of doing a scientific thing, especially when we have such good evidence with skeletal structure of whether it's a man or a woman. Um, and I think revisiting this is really important. I think the discovery is really important. I think the way this is reported is a little bit strange. Um, and we know from, at least from Viking oral traditions and some things that were written down later, that they had a very different view of how women were in their society than uh, maybe other Western societies did at the time. Uh, they're really, I mean, I don't think the Scandinavian people in general had a problem with a female in the position of a warrior. Uh, I think that they uh, probably held that up in great esteem. Likely this is a potential scenario for that to happen. I'll get into some things that deal with that in a bit. Um, but the way it's being reported is if, uh, and it's it's the choosing of the, 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 the words here and, and what they quote, it's like this is shoving something in the face of the patriarchy. Maybe it is, I mean, that, that's not a bad thing if they're wrong, right? And I, I think I will say over and over and over again, the, the people who did this research, they got it right. They were paying attention to um, the facts and their predecessors were not. Uh, and when it comes to history, when it comes to archaeology, uh, we have to rely on those facts. We can't make suppositions. The problem is, is that all this stuff is going to be full of suppositions. Now, I want to get away from this news article that was the first one I, I found uh, through the New York Post. I want to go to one that's slightly better. I want to go to one that is National Geographic. Um, this one's written a little bit more professionally. Not a lot of these wrongs type single word sentences there. Uh, you don't need that to kind of speak to the discovery. And I think this is a much more professionally written article. Um, new evidence, re, uh, sorry, famous Viking warrior was a woman, DNA reveals. This is actually originally a fa pretty famous uh, find, and now it's being revisited. New evidence forces reconsideration of well-known gravesite may shed light on Viking gender roles. Um, you notice that it's talking about shedding light on Viking gender roles, not proving historians wrong. Uh, there's a really big difference there. Um, shedding light on something means that we can see things better. I always, when I talk about history... I almost use like the, the, the fog of war analogy where uh, sometimes our understanding of history is really blurry. And every, find, every time we find a new discovery, new facts come along, better archaeological finds, um, it becomes a little bit more clear. We, we are able to shape that vision a little bit better. The, the Viking era, the, the Scandinavian people... Um, they are a real big mystery to us. We go off a lot about um, oral traditions that were then written down later, and these oral traditions, they are um, they're written down so far after they were originally spoken about, and so it's really hard to say 100% this is exactly how their society was. Um, it, it's, it's akin to if archaeologists looked at the, the stuff that we produce in our stories, things like comic books with Spider-Man and Captain America, and they said... Well, that's how people were. They, they, they had these people who were better than other people, and they, they dressed up in spandex, and they, they were warriors for, for virtue. And then, well, no, these are things we enjoy, and they were he they're heroes, and the, the Viking people, the Scandinavian people had their heroes, some of them being gods, some of them becoming even comic book characters. Um, but it doesn't necessarily reflect pure history, and it doesn't necessarily always shed a perfect light on, on how their society operated. And likewise, we, we are getting a little bit more light here, but we're not proving anyone wrong. Uh, we're potentially proving some original archaeologists incompetent at their job. And surprise, surprise, early archaeology got a lot of things wrong. They did a lot of stuff wrong. So I'm not going to hold that against them. I, again, I think these studies are great. We're actually going to get into the studies in a bit as well to get right to the source. Reading all of this article, um, more than a millennium ago, in what's now southeastern Sweden, a wealthy Viking warrior was laid to rest in a resplendent grave filled with swords, arrowheads, and two sacrificed horses. The site reflected the ideal of Viking male warrior life, or so many archaeologists had thought. New DNA analysis of bones, however, confirmed a revelatory find. 
the grays belong to a woman. The study published recently in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology sends ripples of surprise through archaeologists' understanding of the Vikings. Uh, hold that for a moment. I don't think it's ripples of surprise. I think that I think it's pretty mundane in terms of discovery, but I do think it's important. Uh, Viking seafarers who traded and raided across Europe for centuries. And so one of the things I like here is when they're saying Viking, they're then being very specific about what we're talking about. Medieval seafarers, specifically Scandinavian medieval seafarers, uh, who traded and or traded and raided across Europe. Um, Vikings are not the representative of all of Scandinavia. There are plenty of Scandinavian peoples who are not Vikings. Um, moving on. Uh, it was held up before as a kind of ideal Viking male warrior grave, says Baylor University archaeologist David Zori, who wasn't involved with the research. The new study goes to the heart of archaeological interpretation that, we're always, uh, that we've always mapped on the idea of what gender roles were. Viking lore has long hinted that not all warriors were men. One early 10th century, keep in mind 10th century here, very late in terms of... Uh, how these things were written down and passed down, considering how long some of these legends were around. Uh, one early 10th century Irish text tells of Inged Rud. I'm probably not saying that right, but forgive me, because I'm not able to say Irish things all that well. Uh, who's known as the Red Girl. A female warrior who led a Viking fleet to Ireland. And Zori notes that numerous Viking sagas, such as the 13th century, think about how much, how long after the Viking period that was, uh, 3rd century saga of the Volsungs tells of shield maidens fighting alongside male warriors. These are things we know. These are things that we've always known. Um, evidence for them is hard to come by, but we, we've known this exists and we give it uh, a lot of credence. And I think it's important that archaeological finds helps to support things that we know a lot from like written records. Uh, you look at medieval history, especially in general, we rely a lot on written records, and sometimes finding the archaeological sites for things is nearly impossible, but we don't then discount the things that were written. We just say we don't know where this actually happened or where this occurred. And then when we do find it, uh, and and archaeological practices go through their processes, and we, we say, well, here's proof of these things, then we just check that off and say, well, now we've proved this thing has been written about and we've known about forever. Uh, but some archaeologists, some archaeologists had considered these female warriors to be merely mythological embellishments, a belief colored by modern expectations of gender roles. I want to know who these some archaeologists are. Uh, part of me thinks that that's speaking to those late 18th century archaeologists. Um, yeah, I don't. Th I think most modern archaeologists are probably looking at a lot of this stuff and just saying, well, it might be an embellishment, but it's we don't really know. And a good historian will say, I don't know, not it is blah. Um, assumed male is the title for this section. Uh, since the late, teen, late 1880s, archaeologists had viewed the Burka warrior through, the, through this lens. Textbooks had listed the grave as belonging to a man, but not because the bones themselves said so. Since the remains were found alongside swords, arrowheads, a spear, and two sacrificed horses, archaeologists had considered it's a warrior's grave and thus a man's. Uh, as National Geographic magazine reported in its March 2017 cover story on Vikings, that all changed from Stockholm University by archaeologist Anna Kjellstorm, Gelstorm, don't know how to say it, apologize, Gelstrom, not Storm, uh, closely examined the warrior's pelvic bones and mandibles for the first time. Their dimensions appear to match those of a, uh, typical of a woman. Um, I will say that early archaeology is definitely tinged by uh, that kind of form of weird patriarchy, right? Um, it's just common at the time. Let's move past it, people. Uh, Gelstrom's analysis presented at a conference in 2014 and published in 2016 didn't make much of a public splash, and some archaeologists pushed back. Since excava excavation of the gravesite had occurred more than a century ago, perhaps the bones had been mislabeled, a problem with other nearby graves. Uh, maybe the skeleton had been jumbled up with other people's bones. In response, a team led by Uppsala University archaeologist Charlotte Hardenstein Johnson, Hedden Stierna, I'm sorry guys, Johnson, doubled back to the bones and extracted two types of DNA. The person's mitochondrial DNA passed down from mother to child would determine whether bones represented one or multiple people, and fragments of the warrior's nu uh, nuclear DNA would reveal biological sex. The results were clear. The team didn't detect any Y chromosomes in the bones, and the mitochondrial DNA from the various bones all matched. The remains represented one person, and that person was a woman. 
So they confirmed all the bones were together, and they confirmed it was a woman. This is correct archaeology done correctly. If they had been able to do all this stuff a hundred years ago, I would hope they would have done it. Um, they didn't have that reliability back then. It's 1880s, guys, right? We're going back, we're, re we're relearning things. Hardin Stierna Johnson and her colleagues say that the woman was likely a warrior and respected tactician. On that, uh, at that, on her lap, she had a gaming pieces, said uh, Hedden Stierna Johnson in a previous interview. This suggests she was the one playing the tactics since she was a leader. All right, now that's why I'm going to talk about it. I cannot stand. It bothers me to no end that we somehow equate board games with tactician stuff. Um, I used to play a medievalish board game called Tabloot. It's based on a kind of Viking board game. Um, and I play chess. I enjoy chess. I actually think I'm halfway decent at it. I'm sure there's some four or six year old out there who's one of those masters who can beat me at it. I'm not perfect at it. But being good at board games, even tactics based board games, doesn't suggest that you're a tactical leader in real life. Um, it doesn't hurt. But I think that that's supposition. Uh, it could also just be someone who really liked board games and was buried with it. Or maybe it was a valuable possession for them. Um, it's also 100% possible that it is indicative of them being uh, a tactician leader. I'm not saying it's one way or the other, but I believe it's supposition. And I think that's a little bit dangerous. I think, we, I think facts are they were buried with pieces. What that says about who they were is potentially as much a mystery as the rest of the stuff in the grave, and I'll speak to that in a moment. Uh, in terms of Viking life, uh, Zori, for, uh, Zori, for one, remains fascinated by what the discovery says about Burka, the Viking Age uh, trading settlement where the woman was buried. Home to one of the largest, best-known Viking burial grounds, this site was also a thriving trading hub, flush with the Byzantine and Arab silver for the sale of furs and slaves sent down from Dnieper, uh, sorry, from Dnieper and Volga rivers. Probably said that wrong as well. Here's a nice, by the way, drawing of the gravesite. This is actually an illustration. It, it's crazy because it, it looks like a photograph, but it's an illustration um, of how this uh, find was uncovered and the placement of the artifacts. Uh, perhaps as a result of the flow of goods and people, Burka's grave sites bear a distinct international flair. Sizori burial practices at Burka run the gamut from burning the corpses to seating them in chairs. Burka tied the Viking world together. It's about trade, about exchange, about people moving about, not just to kill each other. Um, he added, depicting the grave's kind of martial ethos in a trading site is also important. It's tying two important parts of the Viking world together. Zori notes that it's possible, albeit unlikely, that the woman's relatives buried her with, with the warrior's equipment without that having been her role in life. Given available evidence, though, Zori says he's fairly confident in the study's results. Good statement on it. Um, it's likely that a person being buried had that as some characteristic to them, that it was representative of some kind of what they were in life. That was actually very common in Viking or Scandinavian burial sites that you bury people with things that represent who they are. They take it with them potentially to some extent to the afterlife and that's things they take with them. Um, that said, there's also plenty of evidence and I, I, you know, it's, you have to weigh it. It's kind of mostly this, but there is some of this that for things being buried with people that it is not representative, that it's given as a, a token, uh, a sign of respect. That is to say that the sword that is buried with this individual might be this warrior lady sword, or it could be the sword of her grieving child who gave that up as part of, a, 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 in a sense, an offering, a sign of respect for the mother, or maybe the community bought it. Um, we know that the Scandinavian people in general were very warlike, and we also know through a lot of their oral traditions that they viewed women as someone who could fight alongside them. I don't think it, it's beyond their own possibility. In fact, I, I think I would agree with Zori here that um, it's likely that she was a warrior of some kind, or at least a fighter. Um, and that, and that he's confident that stage rides. All right, so this is something that's generated a lot of interest through time uh, because of some of the texts of female warriors, and now we're getting into new technologies that can bring those texts and that archaeology into closer contact, he says. This is a great article on it. Um, wonderful article. Now, uh, I want to speak 
for a moment to the idea of women fighting in, in the Viking culture. Um, and I'm saying Viking here, not Scandinavian. I think, and I don't believe this is supposition, I think it's based on what we know about kind of ancient societies and histories, um, that it's very unlikely that women were involved in the Viking portion of fighting. That is to say, the going out and conquering lands. Um, there's a couple reasons I would say that, and by all means, if people have information that proves me wrong on this, please share it with me. Um, but sending your, your women out to fight is actually extremely illogical from a societal standpoint. Um, because you need those women to be able to propagate your society. They need to have children. If you're sending them off to die, they aren't going to have children and your society is going to dwindle. People weren't stupid back then. They knew what they were doing. They knew they couldn't just send them off to die. Now, I think it's also extremely likely that the women were taught to fight. Um, very much like you have very late in the Middle Ages where entire German towns, for example, armed themselves to the teeth and everyone from uh, the fighting elite to, you know, the village candle maker could all actually learn to fight to some extent um, because they needed to have the ability to defend themselves. And I think the, the Viking people, specifically the people who went into foreign lands and colonized it, recognized that they were also extremely vulnerable and arming everyone was probably a good idea. So I think it's actually extremely likely, not just in the Vikings, but also Scandinavian society where you had warring tribes or whatever, that women were taught to fight. I don't think it would be any surprise, and I, 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 I mean, I, I think that's just kind of a given at this point. Um, it says a lot about how their society operated, and it, it spoke a lot to um, how, how they thought about gender roles. Absolutely, 100%. But I really highly doubt that they, for the purposes of conquering a land, would send female warriors out there. Did it happen? Probably. I mean, everything is possible. And uh, we don't have evidence one way or the other, so we just kind of say everything's possible, right? Um, but I, I really highly doubt it because there's a distinct value in the women in a society and the role they play. Um, just like in ancient Rome, uh, we, we have very good evidence because they wrote everything down uh, that you know women weren't being sent off into the Gallic territories to go fight. Um, but likewise, because a lot of the Viking efforts were for the purposes of colonization, there were women going with them. And it's also possible those women fought. They weren't like going in and conquering a, a little area. Well, they did sometimes, but for the purpose of colonization, they weren't going in, attacking a place, building a settlement and then sending ships to go get the ladies back. They, they usually make that kind of in one trip. Um, but, but you don't want to kill off your entire female population either. So they probably sat in reserves to some extent, but they, they learned to fight and not the same thing. They didn't go out there and fight alongside the men. Um, again, speaking to the, this concept, I'm going to go back to something I've actually referenced in a video. It's probably buried in YouTube at this point which is this wonderful article by uh, Tracy V. Wilson, who I really respect. You know, is a kind of an amateur historian, a uh, person who has a great podcast, a lady that I think is really fascinating to listen to, and she talked about a lot of bits of history. She wrote this great article, says, raining on your parade about those women Viking warriors. And this came from, this was a study that came out about a year and a half ago or so. And it was actually came out a lot earlier than that, but then it hit the news. And much the same way as that, like, uh, that New York Post piece where it was like, whoa, you know, we have to completely rethink and everyone was wrong. Um, basically said like something like 50% of the warriors were, were women. Eh, um, it's not what the study said, but that's what people were getting out of it. And I'm going to read through this. Now, it doesn't, doesn't apply directly to the conversation because it is for a different article, but I, I think we have to understand how these things can get misrepresented, how the telephone game is played. And to that extent, I'm then want to go to the actual research article all these articles we're talking about are based on to take a look at how this actually works. Um, so here's a headline that just sounds awesome. Better identification of Viking corpses reveals half the warriors were female. A lot of people have sent us this link in the past two days. It raised my, really, flag? So I got the original source paper, Warriors and Women, the sex ratio of Norse migrants to Eastern England up through, or sorry, up to 900 AD by Shane McLeod, uh, published in the journal early, 
journal Early Medieval Europe in 2011. So it was a pretty old article, but it started making the passes in 2014. So it's been a couple of years. Uh, then I read it all the way through, and unfortunately, meaning that I really hate to ruin everyone's fun here, that's not what it says at all. This paper looks at the history of using grave goods and other methods to determine the sex of remains, uh, rather than using the bones themselves. So, directly tied to the other thing we were talking about here, uh, it was very common practice to look at the goods and not the skeletal structure or the skeletons themselves. Um, skeletal structure is actually a really good indication of male or female, but... Um, DNA is actually even better, and a lot of people just did a shorthand. They, would look, they looked at a lot of graves, they saw they were all men, they just started saying, all these graves are for men. Not good archaeology. Late 18, or 1800s, right? Late 19th century archaeology. Not always the best. We're a lot better these days. Um, so, it looks at the history using grave goods and other methods to determine the sex of the remains rather than using the bones themselves. Using grave goods to determine sex really isn't very accurate. 100% correct there. Uh, how do we know only women wore a brooch like that? How do we know it wasn't pinned there? Affectionately by a grieving spouse or friend before the body was buried. Answer, we really don't. Love this article. Tracy, if you're listening to this video, I don't know how you would, but if you happen to, thank you. You're awesome. Um... And if the question is, why should we conclude this body was a man because it has a spear and a shield? The answer is, we shouldn't. Again, 100% correct. You shouldn't make leaps of logic. You've got to pay attention to the facts. The paper then looks at the grave sites at which, this, uh, at which the sex of the remains was determined using the bones themselves. This method, while still not foolproof, again, DNA is much better, it, it's much more accurate at uh, determining sex than using other non-human remain stuff that was buried in the graves along with the body. A really clear pattern emerged when comparing the male and female ratios at the site uh, that used grave goods against the ratio of the sites that used bones to determine sex. When the bones made the term, uh, where in, when the bones made the determination, more of the remains were identified as female. That is to say, they looked at all the grave goods. They said it's uh, predominantly male. When you actually go look at all the bones. It's actually about half and half. Society's actually about half and half. So based on a very small number of skeletons, and keeping in mind that it is a very small number of skeletons that were originally done versus a plethora that they actually had, so they were actually making other leaps. So this is like logical leaps stacked on top of logical leaps that they originally did. So based on a very small number of skeletons, the proportion of women present at the time of Norse invasions was probably higher than previously thought. This shouldn't be a surprise. People paid a lot of attention to how the Vikings operated because it wasn't just to go get a bunch of goods and then go back to the homeland. They were actually looking to expand. Um, farming wasn't a very great... They didn't have good uh, arable land in some areas in uh, the Scandinavian countries, and um, they looked for much better farming land. The expansion happened that way. It's historical record, honestly. Um, now, the original things were to go get goods and slaves and all that type of stuff, but... That actually was a smaller portion of the Viking efforts. Um, <clears throat> and uh, she says, I say probably because we're extrapolating a greater trend from a tiny number of skeletons. However, this paper absolutely does not conclude that these women were warriors or that the army had even split, had, had an even, even split of male or female fighters. It's, an, it's a, trying to get to the even split of just who was actually buried there. Uh, this is from the study. These results, six female Norse migrants and seven males should caution against assuming that a great majority of Norse migrants were male, despite the other forms of evidence suggesting the contrary. Note the use of the words migrants, not warriors or fighters. This is going to apply to this other article, right? Just because we have a, a woman who's buried even with grave goods that suggests a certain type of role also doesn't mean that, that this is somehow suddenly representative of a half and half. Maybe she's an outlier. We have plenty of female warriors who were outliers, Joan of Arc, uh, Bo uh, Bodicea, um, you have this, right? Uh, we have this in historical record, but they were uh, things that people talked about because it was so unusual. Um, from the study, another important implication of the osteological sexing results is that the Norse women appear to have been present from the earliest stages of the migratory process rather than, as the commonly held theory has it, arriving as part of a second wave after the great army had started to settle the homeland it had conquered. There's all kinds of other research that is really about gender in Norse society, about women fighters and armies, and there's plenty of evidence that, yes, there were female Norse warriors, and neither I nor the source uh, am saying that there were not, but this paper essentially uses the presence of six female migrants and seven male 
as evidence that women and children most likely accompanied the Norse armies with the intent of settling lands once it was conquered, rather than migrating in a second wave once the fighting was over. Yes, this is how it worked. It's efficient. It is, it is sadly, not at all about female Viking warriors, and not some earth-shattering evidence that Norse armies were evenly split among the women and men. I'm as disappointed as you are. I'd say I'm as disappointed as well. I love the idea of all these awesome, big, hulking women going out there and fighting. Um, but we don't have that much evidence for it, even now. Uh, and then she links to some sources there. All right. Because I talked a little bit about the telephone game, I want to actually speak to the actual study itself. We're going to skip around this. I'm going to put some links in the description of this video so you can actually go and, and read up on it. Um, there's a really nice introduction section. We're going to be covering, uh, we're going to be skipping a lot of this because it talks a lot about sequencing and how they did the, uh, the study and the results. And there's a discussion section. This is where, where I really want to get to because I think it's important to talk about what the researchers themselves were actually saying. And I think it's different from what news stores are saying. I think National Geographic is mostly aligning with this. Um, but I, I feel like it, the same thing has happened. It's, it's a different article, but it's the same story. People are jumping up and down saying, like, this is some huge revelation and we're proving all the, all the old people wrong and all that. You know, yeah, when we're always going to prove historians wrong as we get better clarity. Um, that's what happens when historians and archaeologists make suppositions and then we have to go find evidence for it. But in the discussion section of this study published at onlinelibraryforwiley.com, Berka embodies the uh, conceptions of the Viking Age as a period of long distant connection, trades, crafts, and warfare. The archaeological material provides a reference for the Viking Age at Berka. Um, at the grave, BJ581 was brought forward as an example of an elaborate high status male warrior grave. Uh, a lot of what ties this section, the fact they're buried with horses and the weapons and all that, no, no surprise there. This image of the male warrior in a patriarchal society was reinforced by research traditions and contemporary preconceptions. Moen 2011, hence the biological sex of the individual was taken for granted. Keep in mind that the idea of a patriarchal society is still true. Uh, the Viking um, society was still very patriarchal, um, even with Viking warrior women. Um, but just because it's mostly patriarchal doesn't mean that it's not also somewhat uh, equitable. Um, and it's also worth noting that, again, the archaeologists at the time were potentially being very patriarchal in their mindset. We have to keep those things in mind at the forefront, especially in this discussion. A first osteological analysis uh, done in the 1970s identified the skeleton as a female, but this could not generate further this, uh, discussion as the skeleton could not securely be associated to a context when the sex identification and proper contextualization was made and set in relation to the objects at Shellstrom 2016. Questions still raised if the martial object in the grave mirrored the identity of the deceased. That question still remains, generally speaking. Similar associations of women buried with weapons have been dismissed, arguing that the armaments could have been heirlooms, carriers of symbolic meaning, uh, or grave goods reflecting the status and role of the family rather than the individual, Gardalia 2013. Uh, Male individuals in burials with a similar material record are not questioned in the same way. They probably should be. Furthermore, an argument can be put forward that, grave, that the grave originally may have held a second now missing individual. It's possible. In which case, um, weaponry could have been part of the individual's grave furnishing while the remaining female was buried without any objects. However, the distribution of the grave goods within the grave and their spatial relation to the female individual and total lack of typically female attributed grave artifacts disputes this possibility tend to agree with that as well. I, I think this is actually a really good summation of the finds. And this is where I think it's important, and I think that this research is thinking about this in the right way. Do weapons necessarily determine a warrior? The interpretation of grave goods is not straightforward, but it must be stressed that the interpretation should be made in a similar manner regardless of biological sex of the intended individual. I agree. Furthermore, the exclusive grave goods and two horses are worthy of the individual with responsibilities concerning strategy and battle tactics. Um, okay, I'm going to disagree with battle tactics one for the same reasons I, I stated before. 
I, I think that you can have horses because you're a warrior or because you have high status and not because you're a battle tactician. Um, this, uh, also keeping in mind that a lot of Viking uh, combat was not done on horses. That was a means of moving one place to another and it was a status symbol because if you're on a horse, you weren't walking like the peasants. Um, the skeletal remains in grave BJ581 did not exhibit signs of anti-mortem or uh, perimortem trauma, which could support the notion that the individual had been a warrior. Uh, however, contrary to what has been expe expected weapon-related wounds and trauma in general, are not common uh, to what would be expected. Weapon-related wound, or, um, sorry, uh, Burka, e.g., two out of 49 males showed signs of sharp force trauma. Similarly, low frequency is noted of uh, contemporary cemeteries in Scandinavia, e.g., Helgerson, Arsini, 1996. Traces of violent trauma are more common in Viking Age mass burials. And they reference some stuff. Yes. Um, here's the way this works. If someone dies from trauma, they are probably going to be buried in a mass grave because they got to bury a lot of people who died in a battle. People who die of old age or in a more peaceful manner might get the more, um, uh, call it respectful burial, um, singular burial. Um, it is possible that someone in a leader, leadership position dying on a battlefield wouldn't be buried in a mass grave, though. Very important there, because if this person died from trauma, then they might be buried in and of themselves. But they're also knowing that there is no evidence of the trauma. That means this probably, that pr probably this person didn't die in warfare. It's also not always possible to know, you know, um, bones only show so much depending on how deep the wound is. Someone gets their, their throat cut. The only thing, real, only real indication you might have that is nicking on, uh, on bone, right? And there's plenty of the neck here that will decompose uh, and won't leave marks. Um, but all that said, we're also talking about a, a settlement here. So this is likely someone who didn't die in warfare anyway. Because they're, they're in an already pre-established settlement. So they're probably having been established in the settlement. And this is actually where I'm going to then say, I think we have actually have a lot of evidence. Uh, again, it's circumstantial evidence, but it's evidence nonetheless. That what we're talking about here is maybe someone who is held in high regard, maybe a warrior, uh, maybe a person of nobility. And again, things like horses and swords and these things are very common to be seen just with nobility. Uh, maybe this was a really, really important uh, woman who... Uh, was vital to the settlement. I mean, we don't know. I think that's important. And um, that we don't know is, is a very important thing for historians and archaeologists to say all the time, if they don't. Uh, so easy to jump to supposition, I think that's bad. Now, I do agree that, 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 that we should always look at grave sites uh, individually. We shouldn't make preconceptions. We should treat the evidence that's there the same, more or less, regardless. I think that's generally correct, but you have to very quickly get away from that treating everything the same when you begin talking about gender roles in history, because gender roles in history have shown predominantly that fighting forces were male. Um, we have no evidence and no, uh, call it concrete evidence that would suggest that you had a huge majority of women fighting really in, for any society out there, really. Um, it's, it's always been a predominantly male driven aspect of society. Um, get over it. It's, it's just the way it is. Even today with the way that our modern militaries work and we, we are much more open. Um, in fact, we're incredibly open for uh, women having expanded roles in fighting, even in front lines, they're still proportionally very small. Um, call it interest, whatever, I don't think guys are more interested in violence, men are more generally violent, um, the idea of military service seems to be a more male-driven thing, not to say that applies to things individually, but on average, that's the way it is, um, so you can look at grave goods and you can say, here's a skeleton, here's swords, we likely think it's a warrior, I think that's fine to say, the evidence becomes stronger that it's a, that it's probably a warrior when you find out that skeleton belongs to a male, doesn't discount that when you find out it's a female that they're not a warrior, it's still completely possible. Um, but it's also, you have to consider that it's just as likely that, that was placed there as heirlooms or as signs of um, admiration and tribute, just as if it was a male who'd never fought a terrible, you know, a guy who's terrible at war, but he's really good at leading people in a settlement and they want to thank him for it and they give him a sword in his burial. It could be the exact same thing. We don't know. We just don't know. Um,
but I do think it's a very interesting find. I think it, I think it's important for us to revisit some of these old archaeological questions um, and and preconceptions. We should always be challenging those things. Uh, at the end of the day, when I read this, you know what I think? I think nothing has changed. My understanding of Viking society, that is Scandinavian society, that you know is that Viking effort of going out and you know taking people's stuff and or colonizing. It's my understanding of it has not changed at all with these discoveries. It's it's become a little bit more clear. The focus, the fog of war, has lifted a bit. You know, our focus. We got, we got slightly better prescription on our glasses here, but it hasn't really changed all that much. Um, and then again, in closing, I'm just going to note: I hate the fact someone's buried buried with a board game, making them some sort of tactician. I just don't. I don't understand those logical leaps. Um, does not compute in my mind. Maybe someone has some evidence for something to the counter. If you do, please let me know. Throw it in the comments below. Um, but I, I don't I don't see that one as meaning much of anything. And I think that's a huge logical leap, uh, especially considering the um, how common things like games were actually. Uh, and we don't have a lot of artifacts for them, but that doesn't mean they didn't exist. And the fact someone's buried with them, all it could really mean is that everyone recognized that person as an avid player of whatever that game is, right? It's completely possible we're going to have one of the, the really famous chess players these days get buried with a headstone of, a, you know, like a little knight piece. Uh, or maybe they're buried with a chess set. Some future archaeologist, you know, a thousand years from now, going to look at that and say, this person must have been a general in an army. I, I don't know that equates. Um, but all that said, these are this is a very interesting study. Um, and you can see the, kind of the weird progression of how these things get reported. Uh, but I, I would caution everyone when you read these kind of sensational headlines for anything, um, go find the actual source and go find slightly better articles because some not all, not all articles are, are written as well um, and, and take into consideration the actual facts and the findings. Um, great research, good job by the, the actual researchers, uh, good job on National Geographic for, for reporting it in a good way. Uh, very interesting news article here. Uh, I'm probably a pretty long video at this point, but I really think this is a fascinating news article and a really interesting discussion piece. So guys, tell me what you think about this news article. Tell me what you think about the concept of Viking warrior women. Uh, let me know what you think about the concept of using things like uh, game board pieces as a representation of someone's tactical, uh, call it, uh, acuity in terms of real life. Because I, I don't I don't really agree with that, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Tell me what you think about all this. Um, interesting story, but uh, we'll see what else, uh, what other news stories we have in the future. Hope this stuff is good. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. See you later.